Welcome to another artist problem where you've got a problem and I'm here to solve it if I'm not creating it. Today we're going to be talking about the right tool for the job, right? All right, so I need to put a little disclaimer here as I probably should put in front of any video I do because you never know what's going to come out of this mouth. <laughs> but in the past, I've preached you don't have the wrong thing, okay? So what I mean by that is sometimes, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, okay? Um, I was watching a YouTube tutorial, right, and the artist was doing this demonstration and they were using a three color setup. I think it was a uh, raw sienna, uh, cobalt blue, and one other color I can't recall off the top of my head. What I do remember is that when I went to get my paints out, I realized I don't got no cobalt blue. How is that possible with me? I mean, this is my family business. I need to have cobalt blue. M make a note. So. What did I have? I had every other kind of blue. I had a cerulean blue, I had an ultra blue, I had a phalo blue, and I, I had this pause. No, I can't paint along with this person. There's no way I don't have cobalt blue. I have the wrong thing. But my point is, I had to kind of overcome that. You don't have the wrong thing. The tools that you have are the tools that you can be using. You don't have the wrong thing. So what did I do? I used an ultramarine blue in its place, okay? It looks slightly different, but to some degree, I mean, if I'm just copying somebody, I'm just copying their work. I'm not making it my own. So it, in some ways, kind of gave me a little bit of confidence to overcome that having the wrong thing. Like, no, 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 no. I have decided, by force, not choice, that I am going to use an ultra blue instead of a cobalt blue. And you know what? I really like the results. But the point is, I hesitated. I hesitated. I hesitated before doing art because I thought I had the wrong thing, right? But you don't have the wrong thing. Whatever tools you have in front of you are the best tools that you should be using. They're right there. You don't have the wrong thing. You can make art as long as you have some form of art supplies. Simple enough. So when I come in and say, we're talking about having the right tool for the job, but I just got off saying you don't have the wrong thing, what do I mean? Well, there are circumstances where, yes, you can use what you have available, but if possible to make your life easier, you might find that certain tools will make certain jobs work better for you. So let me just jump into a few of the examples I have here to explain the right tool for the job. Okay, so brush to canvas size ratio, all right? So let's look at this big canvas back here, all right? This is a very large canvas. This is probably a 36 by 48. Yeah, 36 by 48. I should do this for a living. So, got my giant canvas, all right? So I don't have the wrong thing. I've got a one inch flat brush. That's the brush I have. And guess what? I can make art. I can take the time if I wanted to fill in this entire background with a one inch flat brush, I could go ahead and do it. Is that the most efficient way to do it? Is that going to give me the best results? Not necessarily. I mean, if I'm doing some form of like pointillism, sure. But if I'm trying to fill in a background quickly, Having a large brush that matches the size of my canvas and what I'm trying to do will not only give me better results in most circumstances, but also save me a ton of time. And I always say this, there's almost anything in this world you can make more of. You can make more money. You can make more art. You can make more memories. You cannot make more time. Your time is the most valuable, precious commodity you have. So by taking advantage of having the right tool for the job, even though it's not wrong to use a one inch brush here, the right tool for the job will maximize your time and also potentially give you even better results because you can get large coverage quicker depending on the type of art you're doing, okay? So it's circumstantial, I get that, but I think you see the point. This is an extreme example, but I do firmly believe that having the right tool for the job and when it comes to the right size brush for the canvas, you always want to use the largest brush you can get away with uh, if you find that you paint large frequently, uh, or even if you're just painting something small like this mat, which is <clears throat> 11 by 12 by 16. If you're using this mat, you know, trying to fill it in with a teeny tiny double zero brush, I mean, I think you understand that there's a proportion. So use the largest brush you can get away with and it will maximize your time and in many cases uh, make the results look better, cleaner, because you're using the right tool for the job. Again, you're not using the wrong tool, I can say this until I'm blue in the face, if you're using something smaller, but you're going to maximize your results in your time by finding the brush that fits the canvas and your needs, okay? All right, time out, time out. I wanted to just say one thing. With that being said, you want to use the largest quality brush you can get away with. Now you're thinking, okay, very self-serving. He wants to sell me these expensive brushes. Just hear me out here, okay? You can go into a 
Home Depot, Lowe's, any of those uh, hardware stores and get giant bristle brushes, right? And they make them in all kinds of quality. But sometimes you might feel like, well, I'm just doing a quick background, so I'll get one of the cheap bristle brushes and it will do the job. It can, but I will tell you from experience that those brushes are gonna leave little brush hairs all over your canvas. And you might wind up spending even more time not only picking those hairs out, but trying to cover them back up again where you, know, you remove the paint with the hair of the brush. So make sure you're using a quality brush that won't shed uh, and that will maximize that time and quality of your art. Now, while we're on the topic of this giant canvas, you might see that I have an easel that it is sitting on. Regardless of if you're painting large or small, an easel might be something that would be the right tool for the job for you, depending on your needs. A lot of people, when they uh, are painting um, on canvas, want to use an easel because it maximizes the amount of viewing space they have of their subject to their art. It also can be more comfortable Right? Uh, if I was to be sitting at a table and painting this flat, my perspective is going to be very, very twisted because I'll be looking at the plane at like a 45 degree angle rather than standing up at an easel where it is directly in my line of sight. Okay? That can help maximize my results using the right tool for the job. It's not wrong to paint at a table. It's not wrong if I took this and put it up against a wall and painted it. It's not wrong. But if you do a lot of painting, you want to maximize your comfort. You want to make sure that you're not getting schmutz on the bottom of your art because it's sitting on the floor where there's lots of dust. An easel is a good investment if you paint frequently and large. Uh, and it doesn't even have to be that you paint large. You, you're, you're painting a subject, right? It's going to give you the best uh, angle for your view. It's going to give you the most comfort, the most flexibility. It can go up, it can go down, I can sit, I can stand, I can adjust the angle even still, I can you know, bring it a little forward, a little back. It gives me flexibility, it gives me options, and there are limited options when you're just putting it up against a wall or on a table, okay? So, right tool for the job if you're doing a lot of painting. Um, an easel can be a great investment. Not necessarily needed for everybody, but a lot of people that are serious painters, man, having an easel will really make your life easier and make your painting experience more enjoyable because you are comfortable. And not to mention the fact that you might be even happier with the way your art looks because you're not trying to fix perspective of looking down at something, but you're seeing something head on over here. Does that make sense? It might. It might not. We got an H-frame easel on wheels. It spins. It folds flat. It goes up. It goes down. It adjusts angles. The wheels will lock so it doesn't roll around as you paint. It's a great tool to have and it will make your life a lot easier. So the same thing for easels can be said for drafting tables. There's a reason that artists invest in drafting tables. They want those uh, drawings to be at a certain angle. They're very adjustable. So when it comes to these things, drafting tables, easels, you want to think about comfort, precision, efficiency. I mean, these are all things that go into it. If you do a lot of drawing, a lot of painting, investing in the right tool can make a huge difference. Drawing is very easy. You're not doing it wrong if you're drawing at a table. But if you're doing it frequently and you want the most accurate perspective, having a drafting table, I mean, it just makes sense. There's a reason that these things exist because they do uh, make your life easier as an artist, okay? So it's not wrong to draw at a table, but having a drafting table, if uh, you're doing a lot of drawing, especially technical drawing, or it's just more comfortable for you to have it at a more upright angle, you've got more options, right? A drafting table, an easel, is designed to give you options. And that's a good thing, because sometimes inspiration hits in weird ways, and you might not even know that you wanted to stand while you were painting. You were in the mood to stand. Maybe you had too much coffee, like Jamie and I do most frequently in the morning, and we're jittery, and we've got to get the painting out. But then at the afternoon, it wears off, and you want to kind of just sit and paint. That's but those are the options, yeah, okay. Katie brings up a good point. I mean, you don't want to be a schlumpy artist, okay? Why not? If you schlump, eventually that's going to, you know, wreak havoc on your back. It, it can, right? It, and you're not necessarily comfortable, and if you do a lot of drawing or painting or whatever you're doing at a table and you're constantly like this, let me do it at an angle here, it, it can cause problems. Not always, but it... It can, especially if you're finding that the ergonomics are not correct. So having the correct ergonomics can make the art more comfortable to do and give you the longevity to keep painting so you're not a schlump like me. Is that good enough? Are you a mass production artist? All right, that's a very intense face I just made. Let me, let me, let me reel that back. Are you? <laughs> I did it on purpose for comedic effect. I'm going to tone it down, okay. Are you a mass production artist, all right? Do you make a lot of art? Do you have art laying around everywhere, especially art that might still be wet, okay? 
If you do, and you want to keep those that you live with or your animals that you live with happy and not take up every horizontal surface in your house, investing in some type of drying rack or storage system might be a good investment, okay? It's not wrong to lay your wet paintings out on a table, but if you want to use that table, you might wish that you had another place to put it. So we've got all kinds of drying racks. We'll throw up a few examples on the screen here. You know, drying racks that are great for watercolor paintings, drying racks that are great for panels. Uh, I mean, there's tons of options. And if you find that space is at a premium, uh, this will help you make more space. Can't make more time, but we can help you make more space. Uh, by more effectively and efficiently storing the art and letting it dry. Uh, and even if it is dry, it's also kind of nice to have it where you can easily get to it, depending on the type of art you're doing, how you're selling it, if you're selling it. Um, you know, everybody's situation is a little different. So whatever you think would work best for you, there are options out there that you should keep in mind. Because a drying rack, storage solutions, man, horizontal space, I, I don't know anybody's home where it's not at a premium. You know, you see a table, oh, I can put X, Y, or Z there, right? It's just, it's, it's a horizontal space. They get filled up so quickly. But if you can have them open when you bring those groceries home, boy, you don't want to have to like put all your groceries down on the floor, move all your paintings off, and then pick them up off the floor and put them on the table. That's just gross. But I seem to wind up having to do it several times. I clean afterwards, before the kids eat. All right, oil painters, I'm talking directly to you. If you are doing oil painting, you are using solvents, okay? If you are doing a lot of oil painting, you are using a lot of solvent and you are constantly around solvent. You're spending a lot of time with solvent. It's not wrong, you're not using the wrong thing if you're using turpentine or a paint thinner to clean your brushes, okay? You can, obviously they exist, they serve a purpose. But if you're in a situation where you don't have great ventilation or you're around it a lot, investing in something like the Chelsea Classical Studio brush cleaner will be a life changer. Might even be, no exaggeration, a lifesaver, okay? The Lavender Brush Cleaner by Chelsea Classical Studio is the only brush cleaner I'm aware of that has no known carcinogens. What does that mean? That means unlike turpentine, unlike um, odorless thinner, unlike bottles I cannot open, oh, mazel tov, okay, this stuff, Smells like nothing. There we go. Oh yeah. Oh no, 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 no. Jamie, this is the good stuff. This stuff is safe to breathe. Yes, you heard that correctly. This brush cleaner is safe to breathe. You might have thought, well, I'm using an odorless brush cleaner. Uh-uh-uh. Just because you can't smell it doesn't mean it can't cause cancer, okay? There are carcinogens even in odorless brush thinner, okay? This, however, has no known carcinogens. It is one of the only, I think, if the only, brush cleaner that has been uh, ACMI certified AP non-toxic, okay? You can be alone in a telephone booth with this, and for those of you that don't know what that is, good for you, you have a lot of good years ahead of you, and it will be fine. It does smell like lavender, but that doesn't bother me. If it bothers you, then, well, maybe you should look into some windows or something. But I think for most people, it's not overwhelming, and again, safe to breathe, and talk about time, Certain things can bring your time up a little bit quicker and you don't want to have lung issues or breathing issues or certainly cancer issues if you can avoid it. So the Chelsea Classical Brush Cleaner is a safe tool to use for cleaning your brushes with no known carcinogens. And if you do a lot of oil painting, I really think it's worth the investment. I want to talk to you about one of my go-to tools, which is this, a self-healing cutting mat. Now you can ask anybody in this room and there's plenty of us in here. Every surface I work on, my desks, my drafting tables, I always have a self-healing cutting mat underneath. Why? Well, a couple of things. One, my obsessive compulsive disorder, I don't want to get paint on certain things. I can easily replace these. Uh, sometimes I find myself using an X-Acto knife and rather than just finding a little cutting mat and trying to make it work, I get a large one of these, like a 24 by 30, 24 by 36. It just kind of covers everything and it's always there. I'm not worried about getting paint on it. I'm not worried about cutting on it uh, because it is a cutting mat. And it just makes a nice, clean surface to keep everything protected underneath. And also, it is very handy to have a ruler. I, I can't tell you how frequently I'm like, is this a 5x7 or a 4x6? Like, even with my genius level of art supply knowledge, I sometimes 
lose an inch. So being able to just throw it right on here and get the measurements, it's a big help. And of course, that's a, you know, a silly example, but there are several times where I just like having that here. Whether it's art related or not, having this kind of measuring tool around is, is, is a helpful thing. And it's not too much of an eyesore. They come in different colors. There's a clear version, a black version. This is the green. Um, you can find something where it won't stand out too much. Like I said, I have it on you know, my, my desks, my actual working desks, and I have it on drafting tables and such. So, but that's just me. You know, this is just a tool that, in my opinion, can really make your life easier, and it's the right tool for the job if you're doing any kind of cutting uh, or if you're worried about damaging the surface underneath, whether through paint or whatever it is, it's a nice protective pad. And um, it's something that I personally use every single day. I want to talk to you about hair dryers. Now, some of you are like, well, duh, I know what he's going to talk about. And you're probably right. I'm talking about hair dryers to dry your art, OK? But right tool for the job. Oh, I got one lassoed over here. This little beauty, listen to me. Trust and believe in what I'm about to tell you. This tool is best and should only be used for watercolor. It will do nothing for your oil paints, and if you use a hairdryer on your acrylic paints, you're setting yourself up for some problems. Okay, let me explain why. When you hit that acrylic painting with the hairdryer, all you're doing is drying the outer layer of the paint, trapping the moisture <laughs> underneath that plastic shell you just made, okay? It will cause shriveling, it will cause cracking. I cannot stress this enough. And I've seen some artists like, well, you know, I'll hit it from underneath and then on top and it balances out. It does not. Stop lying to yourself. Do yourself a favor. Just wait. Acrylics do not take that long to dry. But with watercolor, as long as you're controlling the airflow and you're not pushing water off the painting, it can help speed up the time. And again, time is money. Time is important. Time is valuable. You can't make more. So for watercolor artists, I, I know that you experienced watercolor artists might think this is a no-brainer, but there are plenty of people here that are new to the art, and I think it's important that they know this is a great tool to save you time when you're doing layers, set your background, whatever it is, get it completely bone dry before you move on to the next one. Because if you don't wait the right amount of time, you get into what I like to refer to as no man's land, where it's dry, but it's not dry enough. So when you take that brush and go over it, it starts to bleed out, it doesn't give you a sharp line, it, it's not what you were looking to do if you had had it bone dry, okay? So for watercolor artists, the hair dryer is a very handy tool, but I do not recommend it for any other type of painting experience. Now, speaking of sharp edges, all right, I think a great tool, whether you are constantly needing straight edges or maybe you just do a particular form of art or you want to create borders, I cannot stress how handy it is to have painter's tape. Okay, this is a form of masking tape that has an adhesive on it that's meant to be removed. Okay, so if you're painting and you want to create a really sharp hard edge, yes, you can do it free handed and get it probably straight enough, or you can take a piece of paper. There are ways to kind of do it, but the fastest, most efficient way and the best results come from masking tape. Okay. This is a great tool, artist masking tape. It comes in all kinds of thicknesses from like an, a millimeter up to, what is this, two and a half inches, three inches? Uh, I mean, the sizes are all over the place and that's because there's a need for it. People understand the value behind having masking tape to create hard edges, to create borders. It's a wonderful tool, it really is, and uh, can be often forgotten. So masking tape for your hard edges, for your art, for your sanity. Now, I've used a few terms up here. I've said masking tape, I've said painter's tape, but really what this stuff is, is artist tape. All right, you're giving me a nuance. What, what, what makes it artist tape? Well, it is designed for the fine artist. It is acid free, which is a huge deal when it comes to art. And it is designed to withstand, uh, you know, some of the bleeding that would happen with acrylics, uh, other kinds of paint getting underneath it. I mean, this is designed for you and your fine art needs. Painter's tape is great if you're painting a room and you can use it. You're not using the wrong thing if you're using it for your paintings. But again, best results if you're doing a lot of hard edges, a lot of um, straight lines, borders. An artist painter's tape, an artist painter's masking tape is the right tool for the job, especially because it is acid free. That's a big deal. And it comes off cleanly. All right. If you work with 
graphite, colored pencils, okay, anything that's encased in wood or in some cases just pure pigment or graphite, you own a sharpener of some type, okay? It just goes without saying. However, there are sharpeners and then there are sharpener or errors, okay? And I'm talking about sharpener or errors, okay? What that means is a sharpener that will adjust the size of the wood to lead or point ratio. So we've got these Tagal sharpeners here. You can see that there's, there's a dial on it, okay? Starting at the one, when you sharpen the pencil, you're gonna get a very sharp, stubby point, okay? For some artists, this is great because um, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to have very, very fine control. You're not wasting a lot of the um, pencil when you're sharpening it because you're saving a lot more of the wood, keeping it that sharp point. And so in that case, if you're using something very expensive, very expensive pencil, very high quality pencil, uh, watercolor pencil, colored pencil, graphite pencil, you wanna maximize their lifespan. However, on the other hand, turning the dial all the way over to um, the, uh, the five, that's gonna give you a long point where there's gonna be more of that graphite or colored pencil exposed. And that's a really great tool too, especially if you're trying to fill in a larger area, sort of going back to that point number one, using the right brush for the job, it, also goes for colored pencil. If you're trying to fill in a large area, having you know more of the, the lead showing is gonna give you a, a, a quicker and more even uh, distribution of color than if you're using a very sharp subby point. Now, this will still make a sharp point, it's just a longer point, okay? And we can actually put an example up on the screen in a photograph here that you can see the, the one versus the five and what those look like. So it will help save on the investment of your pencils and it will also give you maximum control of your art. And it's not a very expensive investment to make, but I think it will make a big difference if you do a lot of drawing. Uh, it is the right tool for the job. The sharpener you have is not wrong, but if you do a lot and you want to maximize that availability, you want to maximize that quality, you want to maximize the amount of time and money you're spending on art supplies, this is a tool that you don't have to replace very frequently at all. Unlike the pencils, where if you go through them a lot, you'll have to replace them, so you'll have to replace them less. It just makes sense. To me, in my opinion, it makes sense. Now, lighting. All right, this is very niche -y. The light you have is not wrong, okay? But having a light, especially a color corrective light, that is not only on your art, but on your subject that matches, is ideal. If I'm painting outside, right? The light that's hitting my canvas is the same light, more or less, that's gonna be hitting my subject if I'm painting plein air. Inside the studio, you might be shining a, a, you know, a bright spotlight that's a, you know, 2700 Kelvin, a very yellow light on your art, but have like a 5000K, a very blue light bulb on your canvas. That's, that does not equal great uh, color mixing and matching, okay? Having the same light from subject to canvas can be a huge advantage uh, if, if it is especially in a more dramatic difference. And there are all kinds of bulbs on the market um, that you, know, you can get. Uh, I personally like the frosted because they don't create such harsh shadows. Um, and uh, the, these are natural balanced lights, so it's gonna give you the most kind of pure tones to what's actually the color that's supposed to be reflecting off of those surface, um, the surfaces that you're painting. And having that that matches the light that's illuminating your canvas or paper Having it match, it's gonna give you the most spot on color mixing so that you can match it uh, specifically. I mean, just the other day, I got a pair of shoes in the mail, uh, for example, and I wanted a white pair of shoes, and I put them on in my living room, and I'm like, oh, these, these look pretty good. And then I walked to the kitchen where I have a, a more blue light, a, a cooler light, and I realized that my shoes were like an off-white, and I was like, oh, I wanted a bright white shoe, but these are kind of, these are kind of beige. They don't look beige under the yellow light, but they certainly look very beige under the daylight cool colored light. So just keep that in mind. It is a thing. And if you have a pair of white shoes, test it. Take it to a warm bulb and a cold bulb. See, I'm not leading you astray. I speak the truth. All right, so one of the final things that we want to wrap up is to talk about palettes, okay? Now, it is not wrong, right? We're not using the wrong thing if we're just using a paper plate for acrylics, all right? However, with that being said, you can't really save that too well. You're not necessarily gonna have the best mixing area. It's not necessarily going to be the most ergonomical, okay? Not wrong, but if you do a lot of painting, depending on the type of painting you're doing, whether it's watercolor, oil, or acrylic, you might wanna look at some palette options that would suit your needs. Por ejemplo, for example, if you like to stand while you do your artwork and you are an oil or acrylic planer, a, um, an oval shape palette such as this 
figure it out, Mike, not Jerry, can be a huge advantage, okay? First of all, this particular one is made out of a plastic with a true tone gray, which means that the colors are gonna show up a lot more accurately than they will uh, without that white shining back in your eye. Large mixing area. If you paint in acrylics, once they dry, they'll peel right off, cleans easily, but you can just as easily use oil paint on this, no problem at all. Um, and if you're standing, this is, this is better. It's better than holding a paper plate. This is more comfortable. It's designed to be ergonomically um, spread the weight out across your forearm, and there's a reason that these exist. Now, if you're an acrylic painter and you don't necessarily want to stand while you're painting or necessarily want to hold your palette, another thing that you might want to look into is something like this Soho Airtight Palette, because this one, first of all, has wells for all your colors, a mixing area, but more importantly, it seals airtight, which will give you a longer working time for those paints. If you leave paint sitting out on this, acrylic paints, 30 minutes, they're, they're as good as gone. Putting them in something like this will extend their life for days, if not weeks, especially if you put in, and this goes for watercolors too, I like to take like a little piece of sponge, uh, get it really wet, wring it out, and put it in there. That will keep your paints moist longer. Watercolors, if you like to keep them in the um, tube, you know, so they don't kind of like harden up into a pan. And acrylics, keeping them moist, keeping that little bit of water in there. You can also mist them with one of our spritzer bottles or aqua mist bottles before you close the lid. Give a lot of life to your paint if you've squeezed too much out or you just want to go back to your pre-mixed colors and have them ready for you. This is the palette to have. This is going to do a lot more function than a paper plate and it will last longer, okay? Um, and for watercolor artists, you want to make sure that you're using a palette that's designed for watercolor. You definitely don't want to use a paper plate uh, if you can help it for watercolor. It's not designed for watercolor to be mixed. It's not going to hold together well. A palette, whether it's this um, sealable palette or this one that just has a lid, is going to have a large mixing area and several wells for your colors. And this one, uh, the colors have dried out, so they're kind of in, in a pan form. If you want to keep them wet longer, like I said, you can try that sponge trick. Even if it's not airtight, it will keep them moisture longer. I just recommend that if you do the sponge trick that I told you about, don't let your paint sit for more than two weeks because they can mold. So it's good if you're a frequent painter and if you're investing in things like this because you paint a lot, you're not going to have to worry about it because you're going to be constantly you know, wiping them out, cleaning them up, and refreshing that sponge. But after two weeks, there's a risk that it might start to, to mold. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if you're going to be doing long-term storage, take that sponge out and uh, it will, um, you know, they'll dry out, but with watercolor, they're still completely usable. So that's just sort of a preference thing, okay? So having the right palette is the right tool for the job, maximizing efficiency, comfort, and uh, not wasting paint. So all very important things in my opinion, depending on what type of art you're doing and what you need. And lastly, don't you ever forget that I am a tool, a tool for you and your art. These videos, our YouTube channel, are here to help inspire you to create more art, and uh, it's a tool that I hope you take advantage of. I think that I am probably the number one tool in this room right now. So if you think I'm a tool and you want to use me, you can follow me on Instagram at Mike Not Jerry. Yeah, put that up. I post fun stuff on there, mostly art-related stuff, some personal stuff, some behind-the-scenes stuff, uh, and it's just a way for me to interact with our artist community, and uh, I appreciate everybody that jumps on there, comments, likes, uh, and uh, enjoys the content. It's, it's really, you know, it's not about me, it's about you. It's about trying to inspire you and trying to uh, give you fodder for creating new and wonderful things. I love to see what uh, is posted out there. Always remember you can tag me in your artwork. I love to take a look at it at Mike Not Jerry. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I am the tool for you. So if this video was helpful for you, please give it a big thumbs up. If there is a tool that I forgot to mention, please put it in the comments below. Uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to be notified when we place new videos for tools just for you, just like me. Oh, we should do like that. Dun, 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 dun. I'm walking through Provence. Hold on, I'm taking myself on a journey. Oh, through grass. The lavender fields. Oh, look, I'm going to run through it. Oh, this is the best exercise. The one where you don't have to really move. Okay.